ジョイトズパッカスト。変革への道。こんにちは、伊藤ジョイツです。今日の番組はオルカのグレイスコアンと森太郎さんに出てもらってます。オルカはソラナ城の分散型交換場ですよね。はい。あのぜひちょっと最初自己紹介とオルカの話してもらっていいですか。じゃあ一応自己紹介だけ日本語でしてもらいます。あの。それ以外は英語で失礼します。あの僕は、えっと、ゆうたろでオルカのファウンダーの一人で一応あオルカを始めた前はあのイーサリアムの開発をしていた、えっと、イーサリアム 2.0 の開発と,、えっとレイアー2の R&D みたいな感じを2018年から2020年ぐらいまでやっていました。でその時あのえー、とグレースと会って、うん、あのオルカを始めることになりました。自己紹介は英語でもないですか ?Go ahead.Yeah.Then、yeah. okay. um, yeah. uh, good to meet you.So obviously Grace Kwan, I also kind of go by Ori in the crypto world.So、uh, my background is originally actually as like a computer scientist,、uh, studied at Stanford and worked as a software engineer for a couple of years, always focusing at that intersection、mm-hmm. of technology and design. Uh, later worked at, as a de- designer at several startups and then was actually most recently before starting Orca, working、mm-hmm. as an interaction designer at IDEO Tokyo,、mm-hmm. also focusing at that intersection, specifically trying to help、uh, modernize、uh, technological, technological systems in Japan before starting Orca. And so maybe I'll first ask about Orca and then ask a little bit more about how you met your backgrounds. Can you describe what Orca is right now?、Uh, for sure. Yeah, so Orca is actually the leading crypto marketplace on Solana.、Mm-hmm. Um, as a decentralized marketplace, our, goal, our wider goal is really actually to create economic opportunity through human centered technologies. And what that really boils down to right now is offering this like, open source,、um, easy to use set of、uh, trading technologies that people can both use to actually buy and sell any token easily on the Solana blockchain,、mm-hmm. but also to build pretty much any application that you can think of、mm-hmm. on、uh, a blockchain. So, so is Orca a, a, a DAO and a DEX, or is it a company based in Japan or somewhere else? Or both? I don't、mm-hmm. know. Yeah, so Orca is a DAO. There is、mm-hmm. no formal entity based、mm-hmm. in Japan,、mm-hmm. uh, but it is like a, a platform that's being built by contributors from all over the world, and we're continuously working on the process of fully、mm-hmm. decentralizing that over and, time. And you're the founders, though, and you're here in Japan.、Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 it's sort of in Japanese, it's, it's, in a way, it's Japan Hatsu, right? Yeah. yeah. So、that's、we. Totally right. Yeah, we started building when we were living in Japan.、Mm-hmm. We don't currently live in Japan. We're actually、mm-hmm. just visiting right now.、Mm-hmm. Uh, but definitely we have roots here and have a lot of love for the country. That's very cool. And so, so it's targeting、um, sort of users and developers all over the world, basically. Exactly. Yeah. When people ask what your target market is,、mm-hmm. I think I, I generally just say anyone interested in、mm-hmm. technology and、mm-hmm. the interesting use cases of it. And what makes Orca different from other exchanges and what makes it successful right now? I would say there's really two angles to that question. So, one is like the design angle, which is、um, one that our, our users really love, I think, which、mm-hmm. is that, that ease of use,、mm-hmm. um, really a radically simple approach,、mm-hmm. and I think a radically approachable approach、mm-hmm. to、uh, trading on a blockchain. But the other side is really the technology. Uh, I think we're really proud of the, the team of developers who have、mm-hmm. created our smart contracts. They're all fully open source and really designed.、Um, mm-hmm. And I think this is really where Utaro shines with this focus on making a super efficient、mm-hmm. um, implementation of an AMM on, on chain.、Mm-hmm. And first of all, describe what an AMM is and then maybe describe kind of how you're implementing it if you can. Sure.、Uh, so it stands for Automated Market Maker.、Mm-hmm. And I suppose the design is in juxtaposition to an order book,、mm-hmm. which is the standard way that markets are made in traditional finance.、Mm-hmm. Um, so, very brief history when Ethereum was first designed, people immediately realized that there was potential in recreating kind of a financial system on Ethereum, right?、Mm-hmm. And then、um, immediately people started to try to build an order book on Ethereum,、mm-hmm. but it just didn't work,、mm-hmm. it was too slow. And then there was essentially this like zero to one innovation where、uh, I suppose Uniswap popularized、mm-hmm. it.、Mm-hmm. And instead of having kind of、um, 
each individual trade represented by an order on mm -hmm. the blockchain, which mm -hmm. is too inefficient, they uh, essentially pooled liquidity mm -hmm. so that you know every single market maker is uh, providing liquidity in a single kind of like uh, data structure mm -hmm. uh, on the blockchain, and that made everything much simpler mm -hmm. and much more effective on the blockchain. Yeah. So just for, I think for people who don't do even normal mm -hmm. exchange, I think the just make sure that I understand this correctly. So if you were like a trading company in Japan, what you would do, or an ex a physical exchange, people who want to sell and people who want to buy kind of give us their, give them their orders. And then somebody tries to figure out, do I connect this person to this person is one way, or they might have their own uh, stock and they might buy and sell out of their own treasury. But there's a human being sort of deciding what the right price is. And there's a big market where people are doing these exchanges. And it's kind of like the stock market where you have sellers and buyers, and then you have market makers who might be doing stuff inside. And with the automated stuff, my understanding is that you, you have liquidity providers. So if I have Bitcoin and ETH, I, as a liquidity provider, put both of them in the pool until there's a bunch of ETH and a, lot, a bunch of Bitcoin and people put in Bitcoin and take out ETH, which changes the balance, which then changes the exchange rate, sort of the algorithmic exchange rate. And then other people might then trade the other way to make money on the reverse. And so you basically have an automated market where people are creating liquidity and also buying and selling, and it sort of should theoretically balance itself out. That's sort of this, this, the original Uniswap, uh, straightforward uh, sort of constant um, pool, right? That, that's, that's the sort of the, 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 the original AMM. And so, so yeah. and you're doing something slightly different, right? Yeah, so um, that was the original AMM, like you mm -hmm. said. And uh, interestingly, it was like fairly controversial, mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact that it quickly found product market fit, there were mm -hmm. a lot of skeptics. And mm -hmm. I think one of the most valid criticisms was uh, how capital inefficient it was. The okay. amount of uh, basically tokens that the liquidity providers had to provide was pretty large compared to the amount of trading that could occur. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that, that was kind of like the, the next innovation for AMMs, mm -hmm. which is, I suppose uh, one way to describe it is uh, with an AMM, you, with the original AMM, you have to provide liquidity across the entire price range. Mm -hmm. um, with a concentrated liquidity AMM, you can choose which price range to provide liquidity in. Mm -hmm. And that essentially allowed, um, th that essentially addressed like the capital efficiency problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I think kind of a, a more nuanced point, and I think where we're heading towards, we're already kind of starting to see is that we're seeing this like convergence between uh, concentrated liquidity AMMs, mm -hmm. or I suppose AMMs in general, and order books, where they're starting to look like the same thing. Oh, um, but then there are these like kind of smaller differences I, between the so two. I, okay, so if I understand it, what you're saying with a concentrated AMM, you're sort of putting in liquidity, but you're sort of also putting in a price that you, you, you like, which is kind of a cross between a flat AMM, which is priced completely by the people playing the arbitrage side mm -hmm. to the people who are, who are staking. So if you're putting in the, the liquidity, if you start feeling a difference in the price, you would take it out and reprice it and put it back in? Is that what you Yeah, do? pretty much. I, the slight difference is that the liquidity providers in a concentrated liquidity AMM, mm -hmm. they do not state the price at which it trades at, mm -hmm. but the range at which you want to provide liquidity. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. And if it falls out, then it, it's no longer being used for that exactly. liquidity. Interesting. Yeah. I think the key insight here mm -hmm. is really that a traditional central limit order book mm -hmm. is, we believe, not long-term computationally efficient enough mm -hmm. to really thrive on a blockchain. Right, right. It's not really a blockchain native primitive. Mm -hmm. And so what we've created and what we believe will evolve mm -hmm. um, to basically fill that use case is this concentrated liquidity AMM, which mm -hmm. can fill all the same needs that these market makers have and mm -hmm. provide incredible capital efficiency, but mm -hmm. with greater computational efficiency. So can I, so, so probably, a lot of people who just heard what you said probably still don't get it. And it mm -hmm. probably, I think it relates to the user, user interface question. So maybe I can ask that. Like what's special about your user interface? How do you think about it? And also more broadly, are you targeting people who already understand this stuff or not? And if not, how do you get them from not understanding to understanding or do, do they need to, I guess they need to understand if they're gonna be a liquidity provider, right? 
It's like, what's, what's the process? I guess we should go to the site, but. Yeah, I would say the way to think about it is through the lens of different audiences. Mm -hmm. And so Orca, I would say, has three main audiences. One is traders, one is the market makers, and mm -hmm. then another one is developers. Okay. Uh, but I think for the purpose of this question, mm -hmm. it's really the first two. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, for to be a, a successful market maker, you do need and should have a fairly good understanding of markets because mm -hmm. that will allow you to provide liquidity more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And so the current use Orca user interface that I designed for liquidity providers is really mm -hmm. designed for people who have an understanding of the markets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the, the process that is on the site right now is really like a step-by-step that process for folks to determine what the right price range is mm -hmm. and to be able to set that easily and adjust that easily. Mm -hmm. But it's not trying to teach you what the right price range right. is, right? right. Whereas I think what's actually, again, really magical about the, the AMM model is that even though it's quite, it requires a lot of sophistication for market makers, on mm -hmm. the other hand, unlike an order book, it's very simple to use for mm -hmm. traders. Mm -hmm. So literally anyone can kind of just go on and say, I want to like buy this much of this token with mm -hmm. this much of this token, and they don't need to worry about any of those details. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, the first time I logged on an order book interface, I was like, I have no idea what I'm looking mm -hmm. at. Yep. It's much simpler to use an AMM interface. Interesting. And 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 how do like normal users find your service? I mean, how? Because I know, um, do they? Is it through Google, or are you in, in, embedded in in sites that are offering tokens? And how do the token providers find you as well. Yeah, there's a lot of different avenues. I would say mm -hmm. a lot of people who are just interested in crypto and then uh, trading tokens, like mm -hmm. Orca has a reputation for being easy to use. So when a lot of people yep. are trying out Solana for the first time, mm -hmm. they'll hear about it through friends. I think there's mm -hmm. kind of a joke that people get dragged down the crypto rabbit hole. And mm -hmm. usually there's someone who drags you and that yep. person's like, hey, check out this website. Yep, yep. So, but it, so, but it's because it's Solana. They have to first find Solana first, right? Mm -hmm. And that's is it that usually mostly through applications, or I mean, what what what's the average Solana user if there is one? I don't know. Solana is actually like the NFT community is yeah, very yeah, yeah. booming. So I think these days a lot of people find mm -hmm. Solana through. If I'm joking, I would say JPEGs, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. They want a cool JPEG because everyone has a cool JPEG. And then yeah. once they get into Solana, they're like, what else can I do here? Mm -hmm. um, you need tokens, essentially. Mm -hmm. Tokens are the backbone of anything right. on a blockchain. And right. um, when, when they want to buy some tokens, they, mm -hmm. they end up at a, a place that you can buy tokens. <laughs> and how did you guys end up using Solana? What was the, because you also tried other things before Solana, right? Yeah, I mean, in short, there. So, so we started looking into it seriously in the summer of 2020, mm -hmm. um, and and long story short, there is just this incredible opportunity to basically start building in an ecosystem where there is nothing there, mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's clearly going to be kind of this huge ecosystem. Um, we had just seen kind of the announcement for Serum, mm -hmm. which was um, you know one of the more prominent uh, Solana. DeFi projects, mm -hmm. but that was all there was, um, and and we had been very bullish on AMMs, e mm -hmm. even on Solana, um, and we thought uh, an AMM is kind of a great opportunity to build something on. Yeah, interesting. Um, and and so g going a little bit more back to sort of how you got here. So, but why did you decide you wanted to do a Dex in the first place, and like, what, how did you get there? Yeah, um, I think one thing that Grace mentioned is that the tokens are the backbone of everything, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that that is kind of the the most important building block in in a blockchain. And the first thing you need to do after being able to transfer tokens is to be able to exchange tokens. Mm -hmm. um, and so, at least for me, um, that was one reason. Another reason was um, for me, kind of the design of AMMs is something mm -hmm. that I've always really liked and something that I've always found to be really elegant mm -hmm. and incredibly practical. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I always felt just kind of that, you know, we'd be fortunate to be able to build an AMM on a thriving ecosystem. Yeah. I mean, I would add to that, that ultimately my interest is not really in like crypto as a technology specifically mm -hmm. so much as the impact that we can make with crypto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit agnostic to actually like which underlying technology mm -hmm. it is. I think what's really 
impactful about what we've created is that it is like this underlying primitive that mm -hmm. can be used for for building lots of other applications. Mm -hmm. um, and so the ability to design something like that means that we ultimately have, I think, like a lot of power and influence over a very burgeoning ecosystem and that we can use that for good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and so I think, what is it you, you call it? DeFi for the people, right? <laughs> and and you're talking about um, do it for good. But what what do you think that that what's what's good about about tokens and Web three? Do you think? Yeah. So that that tagline <laughs> is not one that we. I think it's kind of taken a life of its own. Mm -hmm. Originally, it was like DeFi for people, not programs, and it just mm -hmm. kind of came out of a blog post that we wrote mm -hmm. a long time ago. But the, really, the intent there is to underscore the fact that Orca was designed using human-centered design principles. I see. I see. So as opposed to uh, a lot of the interfaces that I'd seen out there, where it mm -hmm. was very clearly just like an interface that clearly as closely modeled the underlying data structures as possible. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It was about designing interfaces that were intuitive for mm -hmm. people in order to create greater access um, mm -hmm. to, to these technologies. Because honestly, I think if you look at what you see in a lot of crypto applications right now, they're increasing inequity because mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. it's just folks who ha are in the know who are mm -hmm. able to purchase these tokens that will, mm -hmm. you know, that or essentially speculate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think my hope for the ecosystem is that long term it can power mm -hmm. these applications that are really like I think at the heart of what crypto is about in the mm -hmm. first place, which is increasing financial access for people, allowing literally anyone to build something new and innovative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would also say kind of at least my personal philosophy is that you know, crypto is at the end of the day, just a technology and it's neither inherently good nor bad, mm -hmm. of course can be used for incredibly bad things, right? Mm -hmm. Like someone can create an algorithmic stable coin mm -hmm. and then pump it up to $20 billion mm -hmm. and then have it all crash in one day and then like cause devastating mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah, just devastation, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it can also be kind of like, if used properly, right? Mm -hmm. I think my, my belief at least is that it can, it can bring real value to people. I mean, what are the some of the best applications that you've seen that people have built that whose tokens you're you're helping right now? Do you have any favorite apps? We were just having this conversation earlier today, mm -hmm. but I think honestly, like the real world applications are not here yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, sort of the analogy, which may or may not hold, but we'll try it, that mm -hmm. I was using earlier today is that let's say there's like this big peach garden, right? Mm -hmm. And then like we want to harvest ripe peaches and give mm -hmm. them to people. These applications that are ready for use are the ripe peaches. But honestly, they're kind of like all unripe right now. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. like, it's not our goal to try to like make unripe peaches like good to eat. Mm -hmm. The goal is to kind of like create fertilizer or create yeah. like ladders so that people can harvest them later, but it's right. going to take time to get to the ones that are actually yeah. useful. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. And I think if you remember on the internet, you know, everything on the internet was harder than using the actual TV or the radio, mm -hmm. but we were doing it with the hope that someday they would be ripe. And, and I think mm -hmm. that the trailblazing comes from people with dreams rather than, you know, how is it, how is it useful right now? So I think that's important, which is to manage expectations of how useful it actually is versus what it's going to be. Um, and, and sort of related to that, because you guys met in Japan mm -hmm. and you started here, but you ended up leaving, right? And we're trying very hard right now to reform both the regulatory environment and other the startup inf environment in Japan. But I, one, I'm curious, you know, what you think about the environment when you guys started and do you see change and what do you, what do you think the changes um, should be or could be to make it easier? Yeah, so um, I I feel like I don't, at, at least for me, you know, I didn't grow up here mm -hmm. and I don't understand kind of the current system. So it's hard for me to kind of like judge mm -hmm. the system, but I do know that there are a lot of DeFi founders or just crypto founders that have left Japan mm -hmm. and, uh, they've all left for like the same reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's clearly a pattern here. I, I believe maybe some of them have been on this podcast before too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and they've been quite vocal about it, right? Mm -hmm. what, what, whether it be like kind of the regulations or or the taxes. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. yeah, it, like frankly, it is like very difficult to be, you know, a DeFi founder or a crypto founder with even with like good intentions mm -hmm. and like be here. And I think that 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 is kind of a shame yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think it's especially a shame because there is such a history of crypto innovation mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. early days in yeah. Japan. But ultimately it 
has to be welcomed, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. like back when I was working at IDEO Tokyo, mm -hmm. I really believed in and embraced the mission mm -hmm. of enabling change in Japan through mm -hmm. design and creativity. Mm -hmm. But uh, like the clients were receptive to it and mm -hmm. that's why it works, right? Mm -hmm. Like if the the community around you is not receptive, it is not my place as like an American to force them to accept it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And like, so what was useful along your path? I know you worked with uh, Mozilla and the Ethereum Foundation. I mean, if if you look at other entrepreneurs, I mean, are there, there are things that you did that you would recommend or people or institutions that helped you? Hire really good people in the sense of like ethics and values. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. I think talent is really important as well. And, you know, sometimes it can look for, like, feel like looking for unicorns. But mm -hmm. I think the fact that Orca has this strong mission that we're also like working on the side to fight climate change mm -hmm. and that I think we're ultimately always like very mission oriented is very rare mm -hmm. in crypto. And it's actually allowed us to attract a lot of really high quality contributors to the protocol who mm -hmm. want to see it survive um, for the long term. And, you know, crypto life cycles are very short for a lot mm -hmm. of protocols. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, we really did start out with nothing but like dreams. We had no backing. Mm -hmm. and I think the fact well, that we what, were able to grow. When was this again that you started? 2020. 2020. Like, peak okay. COVID. Peak COVID, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more of like w when you met and the, the in relationship between COVID and uh, your development and how you ended up working? I think COVID really enabled it. We sometimes joke that Orca mm -hmm. was like a COVID baby because what essentially happened is like I moved into this share house and basically that same week, mm -hmm. uh, the company I was working at went entirely remote. Uh, we were in this share house pretty much 24-7 after the state of emergency mm -hmm. happened. And if you just kind of keep people cooped in long enough, they'll get mm -hmm. bored. Mm -hmm. And in our case, that boredom led to a desire to just do what we do best, which is just make things. Mm -hmm. And so it was literally like a chance meeting at the breakfast table in our mm -hmm. lounge. I was like, well, cool. I'm bored. You're bored. I'm a developer. <laughs> you're a developer. Should we build something? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we initially had built something on Ethereum, but it mm -hmm. wasn't really meant to be a business or anything. It was really just out of boredom, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being cooped up uh, during COVID. And we had, it was basically, basically like a weekend project. I think we spent mm -hmm. like, well, we it, said it was a weekend, weekend project and it turned into like a three weekend project. Yeah, it was like a three <laughs> weekend project. Uh, and, and then that was, you know, essentially when we, when we started seeing Solana. And mm -hmm. I suppose crypto itself was you know, at least like uh, this past cycle, mm -hmm. uh, obviously kind of like impacted by COVID and mm -hmm. probably amplified by COVID. And so um, we had gotten a little lucky uh, kind of riding that wave. I was not interested in crypto at all. Oh, like, so you weren't, I, you weren't, you were, you were a designer and zero. he had to talk you into it then. I would say I was like pretty aggressively pulled down the rabbit hole and oh, pretty really? much like resisting all the way down until I finally like got to the bottom. And I was like, this actually is pretty cool. And there's yeah, a lot of things yeah, you can do yeah. with it. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, Grace was very, very skeptical about crypto. Uh, I think for kind of the same reasons, a lot of crypto skeptics are, mm -hmm. you know, kind of afraid of it because uh, it, um, on the surface, it's like mostly about speculation. Yeah. yeah. It's unregulated. You know, there's, there's basically kind of like, it, it just looks scary. It looks scammy. It, it yeah. looks very scammy. It's yeah. pretty scammy. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's kind of cheesy. <laughs> it is very cheesy. Yeah. It's like all these like grown adults like freaking out over dog coins and like, yeah. 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 you know, yeah. but yeah. there's also so many amazing things you can build with it. Mm -hmm. And I think what really convinced me, I remember when we were having a lot of these hard discussions early on is Yutaro saying that if we are able to basically like take a slice of this pie and have some flat mm -hmm. power and influence over the space, we can use that power and influence to push it in a positive direction. And that made sense. Cool. Well, hopefully, um, yeah, because the way I, I sometimes see it, it's like I have friends who, well, that used to be good friends that just constantly write about all the horrible things. And it's kind of <laughs> like if you have a mailbox with 90% spam, you can open all the spam and talk about how horrible it is, or you can, open the 10%, that's actually interesting email. And I, I think that's kind of where you fall. Are you looking at the small number of really interesting projects or do you just look at the scammy stuff and it gives you a very different Im image? And I think that a lot of the media is focused on sort of the scammy stuff, but hopefully hopefully we can make some of that go away, partially through user interface, right? 
making it making it more clear. Yeah, that's definitely the help. And then, you know, so one of my I was just chatting with um, Aya Miyaguchi today on, on Telegram, and she was in Bogota, and they're you know doing the we're just finishing up DevCon, but but I, I love the 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 phrase that they use, for, which is a protocol for human coordination, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm you know curious about going getting back to the sort of people centric stuff, but. Um, you know, how do you see sort of the, the, the role of tokens and decentralized exchanges? And, and so, so we were saying, well, it's not the, the, the pairs aren't that right now, but what do you imagine it's going to be like, you know, five years from now or when the pairs are ripe? And what do you think, what, what do you think we're going to be able to do that we can't do now? Any ideas? Yeah. I mean, I kind of imagine it to be something like, kind of a Roblox, you know, mm -hmm. I think what we're doing is building this like ecosystem mm -hmm. for probably people who are like younger and more in tune with whatever's coming next to come up with like mm -hmm. really crazy things. I do hope that we'll be able to see some things that are like very clearly problematic today mm -hmm. um, get real applications. I know there are folks trying to build, for example, um, some like real estate focused applications on Solana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another one that I'm very interested in, I've done a deep dive on, is carbon uh, offset marketplaces. Mm -hmm. And I think tokenizing carbon is mm -hmm. one that I would love to see at least improved on the blockchain, like mm -hmm. access, transparency. Uh, but then there's also, you know, games, all of the, the kind of entertainment is one that's already taking off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But more than that, you know, I, I want to see something that I'm like, I would never have thought yeah. of that. And yep. it's incredible that they're using Orca. Yeah. 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 I, I think um, there's definitely going to be uh, kind of a lot of use cases that, you know, none of us could have imagined. And I mm -hmm. think that will be exciting. In addition, one that I think will be interesting is kind of the transformation of kind of the way currencies mm -hmm. um, are, they exist. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. one example uh, that I'm sure everyone's familiar with is just like, you know, the fact that we have in America, the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. and then, you know, a few times a year, Powell will like give a speech mm -hmm. and then everyone will, you know, decipher <laughs> the speech to figure out how like interest rates will change over the future and then you know, folks will buy or sell stocks that way. And like, that's basically how the economy is largely kind of controlled. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's very, if you think about like the, the, our current technology, it feels very arcane. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, tokens and, and blockchains can kind of be this like new building block mm -hmm. uh, on top of which potentially, you know, a, a more sane or a more efficient mm -hmm. kind of financial system can be born. So I think that'd be really exciting. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I, this I, I don't know if you you feel this, but so I, I remember when we were starting the early internet. Um, I had an internet service provider. We were the first commercial internet service provider in Japan, and I wanted everyone to build applications that would be useful that we hadn't thought of. But everybody built internet service providers, mm -hmm. and we had hundreds of internet service providers, but no applications. And mm -hmm. that was kind of a, I felt it was really dumb. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I'm curious what you think about new exchanges. I mean, like in Japan, there are like lots of exchanges and a lot of people try to build exchanges. And I guess it sort of would be self-serving for you to tell people not to build exchanges. But I mean, what do you think about sort of exchanges as a business? And do you think that there is a lot of innovation that can happen with new exchanges? Or do you think that, that, that you know, that you want people to just leave you alone? Um, so I think at least in terms of the core smart contract design, I think we are actually in the final stages of kind of the evolution. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure in terms of like, you know, how to build a company that supports an exchange mm -hmm. or like go to market strategies or business models, there's going to be like, you know, we're, we're going to continue to see innovations. Yeah. And, and there are a lot of, I still see um, different types, but DEX business plans are like a third of the stuff that I see, especially in Japan. Mm. Yeah, I would say it's really important to draw a distinction between a centralized exchange, yeah, which is yeah. obviously very limited by regulation. Mm -hmm. And then these like decentralized exchanges or trading protocols, mm -hmm. which are very limited by the need to be <laughs> decentralized. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're decentralized, it's much harder to coordinate. Yeah. And it's much harder to grow. Mm -hmm. And a lot of creativity, I actually think in the traditional web two space comes from being able to fund ideas that have no mm -hmm. obvious value capture or mm -hmm. business model. Yeah. And that doesn't really happen often in 
the decentralized space mm -hmm. uh, because you kind of need to stay lean. And if mm -hmm. you're going to stay lean, then it's very hard to fund these side ventures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we will probably see that happen once people figure out how to yeah. do decentralized governance more efficiently. Mm -hmm. But the peaches aren't ripe yet, you know? <laughs> It, but it's, it's also hard to change a protocol once it's out, right? I mean, even with like Uniswap, they have version one, version two, version three. I mean, do you have that issue as well? Or is it different with Solana? Or is it different in your architecture in terms of new versions? I would actually say the flip side is it's actually quite a good thing for mm -hmm. these core protocols to not change too yep. often. Like there's a lot of funds at stake. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Ideally, yeah, you know, yeah. people trust it. And it's kind of better to have an immutable core protocol mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that everyone can kind of trust to to behave in a certain right. way. Um, sort of the so, the, so so there is kind of a need for new protocols though then, because that's the mm -hmm. way that you're going to evolve with new ideas is more creating new ones rather than modifying the old one if you use your yes point, right? so i would say that uh for us the the core contract is probably close to the final state i see yeah. um and since we were talking about uniswap i, th I think that's actually true for them too mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. they're actually close to the final state okay. and there's likely not going to be a uni v4 yeah, yeah. although who knows yeah, yeah. Yep. But that's the dream of DeFi Legos and composability, right? Mm -hmm, you get mm -hmm. these core primitives, mm -hmm. and then people use that to build something so, else. Yeah. And it's really no different than the fact that there are a zillion amazing free resources that anyone can just download on NPM and use to like mm -hmm. launch a Web2 product, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're just like building those building blocks yep, right now. Yep, yep. So we've been aggressively dodging your questions about real world use cases of yeah, crypto. Yeah. But one that is extremely basic and I think extremely valid that I've seen mm -hmm. is really people just choosing, having more choice for mm -hmm. where to actually just store their assets, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, right now, a, a lot of people see their the, the currency that is available to them in their home country is mm -hmm. maybe not the ideal place to store mm -hmm. you know their their currency that's right, probably right. something that feels very relevant right now yeah, right yeah. Um, but you know I have friends in Indonesia who actually keep most of their savings or immediately just basically trade it to mm -hmm. USDC mm -hmm. um, and that's a choice that they're able to make because of crypto yep. maybe it could be USDC or Bitcoin yeah. but you know well, hopefully Japanese yen someday I, I, I was talking to some people <laughs> in the government that were saying that at least larger governments or other countries are now, because you know, the Americans froze the yeah. US dollars uh, for Russia. And so they're now wanting to hedge against the dollar, which is kind of interesting. I think it's an opportunity for other stablecoin countries. Um, and so yeah. hopefully Japan comes up with a cool, um, I'm, I'm worried that the law doesn't come out the way we want it to, but hopefully that'll be a good thing if they do it right. I guess like one one question for for you is like you, you mentioned uh, kind of like the parallels between crypto now and then internet mm -hmm. back in the day. Uh, is this all this? Do you feel like this is all kind of the same thing, or do you see kind of key differences? I do think that because we're at the value layer, um, the stakes are higher. And if you look at the institution, so the the, the internet service provider email layer was telephone companies, and then the sort of web one, two was advertising agencies, retail and media. And now we're going after politicians and banks, mm. which are tougher, right? And they have more power. And so, but each of these layers, they all had power, but it was a different kind of power struggle. And each time, you know, they start out kind of coming after you and then you sort of push back and kind of win, but then they eventually take over again. Like the, the all the internet in, in event ISPs were squalid by, the um, uh, telephone companies again, and they're still around. And the advertising agencies are still around. The media companies kind of gotten beaten up and now we have platforms, but different kind of media companies. So my worry really is that we have this wonderful decentralized image, but that, you know, it gets kind of pushed aside and it gets re-centralized and it goes back to business as usual. So I think that's my fear, but that's what I, I'm, I'm more careful about being optimistic because each time I thought mm -hmm. that, you know, by, I thought by now we would have free Wi-Fi everywhere um, and, and no, and we didn't ha wouldn't have to pay for cellular. And I thought that we would have, you know, much more decentralization across the board. Because each time, even with Web 2.0, at the beginning, all the blogs were run on people's personal servers. There was an open protocol for how the posts were shared. So you could download all your posts from one blog service and mm -hmm. upload them to another. There was a 
a common API for posting. So we had we created apps that could post any blog. You know, so it was actually decentralized. And then with Twitter and and Facebook and stuff, it recentralized. So so even when we say you know Web 2.0 was about centralization, it wasn't at the beginning. You know, and so I think always at the beginning with the early adopters, there's a mm. kind of like a happy, bright-eyed moment. And I worry a little bit. Especially when you look at like how people responded to Tornado Cash, they were like, "We're decentralized. We can't be controlled." Oh, somebody went to prison. Oops, we're going to follow <laughs> the American protocol, right? And I think that was pretty wimpy. And I worry that that's kind of an indication of how spineless <laughs> people are, actually. You know? Yeah. I mean, what about Japan specifically? You know, we touched on it earlier, but yeah. I think there's obviously a huge opportunity. For digital transformation to make an effect mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. Japan, but how do you think crypto plays into that? What are the opportunities? So for me, the current thing that I'm excited about is I think that Japan didn't have as much crypto summer because it was already locked down, and so there isn't as much scammy image. There's still some, but not like the U.S. And you don't have you don't have like Elizabeth Warren and Gary Gensler coming after crypto. Um, and so there aren't as many ne powerful negative people. And the big companies are all kind of willing to try. Mm -hmm. And so I think that enterprise um, Web3 and then local government Web3, you have like Yamako Shimura and you have Shuacho and these local governments trying this stuff. So I think that the nonprofit, academic, local government stuff might happen here. And I mm -hmm. think that big companies trying blockchain or like the government, for example, you know, issuing... Um, you know, CBDC or issuing wallets and doing some sort of like, I think, I think something like that might happen in Japan at a scale that other countries haven't done and that it'll become more normal people's Web3. That's, that's the dream. And I think the, the risk is that the regulation doesn't change fast enough or that sort of people who are negative start to um, come out and, and sort of beat it up. Um, so we'll see. I think, I think right now we're so far kind of on track for um, actually unlocking Japan. So, yeah. so you, should, you guys can come back and hang out more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, based on our conversations with folks who are even like fairly high up in a lot of fintech companies in mm -hmm. Japan, a lot of that, I think, hesitation is really just driven out of a lack of understanding and, yeah. and fear. Yeah. And there's just not a lot of people in Japan who can probably explain those things to yeah. them in terms they can understand. So, you know, I don't claim to, to be the perfect person, but, you know, if there's anything that Yutaro yeah. and I can do to help, you know, yeah. well, I would love the to. The thing is just to come back and um, mentor people, mentor entrepreneurs, um, I think, the, the, and, and just share your experiences in the media and stuff like that, because I think there's a lot more attention now. So I think it'd be great. Well, thank you guys so much for coming to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.